Cool. I'll talk about uh, well, I apologize for speaking in English, and uh, please feel free to ask questions also during the talk. Okay, so we can make it interactive. Um, okay, this presentation is part of a project we are doing on security of uh, existing routing protocols, mainly uh, trying to promote RPKI and get it deployed and also extend it in different ways to make maximal functionality and, and uh, incentivize deployment. And uh, this particular work is, uh, well, the title says Secure Routing with RPKI. I'll talk a bit about the status of it, the challenges that we are facing, and some of the directions we are uh, working on in order to make it uh, deployed. So in uh, this talk also, I'm not assuming too much of uh, prior knowledge about RPKI and so on. So bear with me if you know everything at the beginning till I get to the part that uh, may be new to you. Okay, without uh, further. And, oh, and this is a project uh, with uh, uh, Thomas Halbeck, Yafim Kazak, Refi Perez, Fabian Sauer, and Haya Schulman. Okay. So route hijacking. Route hijacking, as we know, is a big problem today. Where, uh, and this is, a, I think, an, one of the nice examples of this uh, of this attack, where we see that the, in the green, I think this does this work? Yeah, in the green here we see the the normal route from Guadalajara to Washington. The packets will take, but oops, yeah, but then we see in red an incident where the route is suddenly going through London, Moscow, Minsk, Frankfurt, definitely not a reasonable route to take. And that must have been the result of an intentional attack. Now, there are all the time misconfigurations in, uh, in the routing tables and so on, but uh, quite clearly there is also a significant amount of intentional attacks uh, for different motivations. And that is the problem that we want to address. Okay, what are the goals of the, of the attacker? What are the motivations of the attackers? So one motivation is eavesdropping and or possibly modifying the content. Uh, that, uh, that motivation specifically could be solved if the information is protected using a cryptography, of course. Some of the other motivations are more uh, are harder to, to deal with, uh, to prevent. One of the important motivations is phishing and spam. Attackers just use this hijacking in order to g gain access to a block of IP addresses, and then they use them and they change the block from time to time, and in this, in this way they avoid uh, being blacklisted or the effect of blacklisting, and that is very widely used. Malware distribution, similarly to avoid blacklists, so draw points of uh, malware distribution are also changing in a similar way. So in general, to avoid reputation, IP-based reputation me mechanisms, I would say, uh, hijacking is very effective. And then, of course, we have uh, the use of, of uh, IP hijacking in order to attack uh, addresses, to do censorship, to do uh, denial of service attacks, and, uh, and uh, to do traffic analysis in order to learn about information, to de-anonymize communication, and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a big problem, and there are many d proposed and uh, partially standardized de and deployed defenses developed over many years. This is a problem that the community has been putting a lot of attention for many years. Uh, um, and the, our challenges and focus is on trying to have deployable solutions because, uh, which will also be effective because the fact that the community has been struggling for, with this for so many years, obviously there is a the problem of getting solutions which will be deployable, okay? So that's uh, the, obviously a, the big challenge and that's what we are trying to focus on. Okay. So just uh, if, in case you're not completely familiar, brief explanation how these attacks work. How is this prefix hijacking works? Okay, so here's a very simplified network. Of yeah, here's a very simplified example of uh, just uh, four uh, ASs. And one of them you see, IS666, is the attacker. Okay, so this AS is trying to hijack traffic 
which is sent from AS1 to 333. In order to do this, it, it is sending an incorrect uh, BGP announcement claiming to own, to host, the prefix of uh, uh, 333. Okay. So here is the correct announcement from uh, uh, 333. Enter out is simply itself with the prefix uh, 120016. And it is sent to 22, which adds itself, normal BGP, everything is simple here. Okay, but what happens is the attacker simply sent also an announcement claiming to have the same prefix. So this is why we call it prefix hijacking. It's also a very simple attack. You just announce BGP announcement with the prefix, okay? And you send it. In this case, AS1 will prefer to send the traffic to the attacker. And the reason is that the path is shorter. And BGP, it works normally according to a policy, which is, which is the, controlled by the specific AES, but one of the basic things done in these policies is to prefer the shorter path. Okay, and therefore uh, it would, in this example, send to the attacker. Okay, in another variant of the attack, which is, in, and that's a, a, a very important variant, is the sub-prefix attack. It's a very similar to the previous attack, except that now the attacker is, is announcing a sub-prefix of the original prefix, okay? And why is the attacker doing this? Because as you can see in this example, the, the previous attack would have failed. It would have failed because the attacker is already more far away from the, legit, from the sender than the legitimate prefix owner. Then if it would just claim to have the same prefix, it will lose because it will be a longer path. And in fact, you should remember that passes on the internet are usually very small, AS passes, not counting routers, but, but counting autonomous systems are very, very short. In fact, there are a bit, the, the average length of a pass is less than four, it's 3.6 or something like that. So it's, it's pretty, really pretty short. And in fact, we have seen there are, we have measurements that show that a lot of the most important customers are even in shorter uh, path lengths, path again in the sense of the number of autonomous systems. So adding your, so being in shorter or in equal, even equal lengths is really difficult for the attacker. And the attacker may many times be in this situation that we are showing, that I show here, where the path to the attacker is longer. However, the sub-prefix attack is, would still work, and that is because, uh, let's see, the, the attack here, the attacker is sending the sub-prefix, right? And although the, the route to the sub-prefix is longer, you see it's 666, versus the, the legitimate route is only 333, so it is shorter, still the traffic will go to the attacker because it's more specific, and we always prefer to send in IP to the most specific prefix. So the most specific prefix always wins. So that's very useful for attackers. Okay. Which brings us to the solution, the standard solution to these attacks. And there, there is a standard already for quite a few years called RPKI, and one component of, of that standard is a mechanism which, for, which is called Route Origins Validation, or ROV, which is designed exactly to address this, uh, this problem, okay? So what happens when we are using this mechanism? So we, we have these two announcements here, but the Route Origins Validation would, would throw away the incorrect announcement uh, because uh, it will know which domain is authorized to announce a particular prefix. So that is actually addressing this problem as well as the sub-prefix problem. And the question is, how does it do it? How, do we, how does this mechanism work? And then, of course, the question is, how is it deployed? Is it deployed? And the answer to that will be, it's not widely enough deployed. And then why and what can we do? But first, let's understand what it is supposed to do, how it is, this mechanism is supposed to provide uh, this defense, okay? Uh, 
And actually, there are multiple ways we could have tried to achieve this goal of filtering these invalid uh, announcements. Okay, so let's look at these ways. Okay, the first way is very naive. We would keep a list, every domain, every AS, would keep a list of the association of which AS is allowed to announce which prefix. We could learn it, you know, we could learn from our friends and so on, and we could gradually learn and all the who is, who is allowed to announce each prefix. That's, of course, really unmanageable, however, because how can we you know, keep track of all the prefixes? And that's really unmanageable. So the alternative would be to check online. And in fact, we, we have the, the databases, ASDBs, which, we could, which are listing normally uh, who is allowed to, who is owner of which IP prefix. So we could consult these databases and try to see, you know, where, is this AS allowed to announce a particular prefix? However, that, that solution is also problematic because of the online communication and even more so because these databases are not sufficiently well maintained. And that's a reality which I'm sure you are, many of you are aware that, that these databases are not sufficiently well maintained to make routing decisions and to filter out based on these databases. So, so many times you, we will be able to use the, the local database for our own customers, but using the databases of remote ASS and making decisions on any announcement based of, on them is rarely you know, useful enough or reliable enough. So the solution is an offline centralized mechanism where we have digital signatures, so we don't need to do any online query, and the database is very precisely and well maintained centrally uh, by, by the internet registries. And that's the solution of route origin of, of RPKI. Uh, so that's why we're using here PKI, public key infrastructure, and uh, specifically this announcement, we call them route origin authorizations. Let's look at this. Okay, so here is the heart of the RPK of the, of the routing public key infrastructure. And that heart is this route origin authorization, which is a very simple announcement. Uh, I, I'm actually split, a bit simplifying RPKI here, so I'm focusing on this route origin authorization aspect. RPKI has another aspect which is critical, but less, but not necessary to understand what I'm trying to present here, which is how do we actually get the public key for each AES? Okay, so let's ignore that for now and say we do have a mechanism to get the public keys for each AES. Each AES can get a public key. That's not too difficult to, to actually get it. So if you, are, you own some address block, you can get an, a certificate which says that you own that address block. And now you can issue, as an owner of the address block, you can issue these route origin authorizations. Route origin, oh, oops, oh, this goes backwards if, when you don't want it. Right, okay, let's try not to do it. Yeah, route origin authorizations which are linked together the pref specific prefix with the specific o origin which is allowed to announce it, and it is signed by the owner of the prefix. So each, again, we assume that we know we can, uh, we can check the certificates of the owners of each prefix, and now the owner can decide, okay, I allow the following AS to announce it, and allow another AS to, allow, to announce a prefix. Furthermore, when you allow an AS to announce a prefix, you can also specify a parameter called max length. And max length means how, what is the, the longest sub-prefix, what is the longest announcement, the most specific announcement that you can make if you are the Z, uh, or Z, ZAS, which is allowed to announce a prefix, what is the most specific announcement it can make? So for example, if I gave a prefix 16, uh, maybe I allow the, the, the origin to announce it either 16, 17, 18, or 19. Or in this example, or, uh, uh, yeah, in this example, let's say that I announce uh, it up to 20. Okay, so I even allow him to announce 20. So I put max length 20. So the origin is allowed to, annu to announce a prefix and any sub-prefix of it until 
sub prefix of length 20, but not more than this. Okay. Um, and then this facilitates route origin validation. What route origin validation essentially tells the, uh, the router, the domain, is you should drop any BGP announcement where the AF uh, conflicts with the raw. So you, if, you, if you have a raw which covers the IP prefix, and if you don't have a raw that covers the prefix, then of course this does not apply. But if you have a raw that covers the prefix, but the raw, all the raws, and you may have multiple raws covering the same prefix. As we said, you may announce for the same prefix. Uh, it could be announced from two different ASs, uh, so maybe five or 10 different ASs, for example, for any cast. So you will need it sometimes to do this, right? But you look at, now you, if the prefix is covered by some raw, you look at all the set of raws that you received, and you look at the BGP announcement, and you say, is there any raw which allowed this announcement? Where allowing means, you know, that the prefix, that the AS is one of the, is the AS indicated in the raw, and the length, the specificness of the prefix is within the allowed max length. If not, then you are supposed to drop this prefix. So this is route origin validation, and that's what every AS, every transit AS is supposed to do. If, and if it would, everybody would have done it, then actually we could have got rid of, of this prefix hijacking and sub-prefix hijacking attacks, which are the most common, most easy to launch, and most effective attacks on internet routing. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the situation. So that was the back background on RPKI. That's what RPKI is. That's what how it's supposed to work. How is it deployed? Is it widely deployed? Not so much. What, and what is the impact of this partial deployment? Okay, and so that's what we'll discuss next. And then, of course, we move to how can we improve deployment? Okay, okay. First of all, deployment of RPKI includes at least deployment of these two main elements: the ROAS and the route origin validation. Where the ROAS are actually the most basic, because if you don't have ROAS. You cannot do validation, obviously. So how is the, the uh, deployment of ROAS, okay? And we see the graph. The graph is not just of ROAS, the graph is of uh, uh, IP, IP prefixes. And you see that we have three lines. One is the IP prefixes where there isn't any raw, And you see this is increasing. This line is increasing because the internet is growing, okay? The green line is the good stuff. These are the IP prefixes which do have a ROA. And, and the and ROA is valid, everybody is happy. And you see this line is also growing. Okay, so, oops, again. Uh, yeah. So, this line is also is growing, so we, are, we see that there is progress in deployment of RPKI. Okay, however, the progress is not as, as much as we see in this slide, because we, we have to remember the internet also grows, so actually it is a bit slower. But still, you can see that the incline of the green line is, is larger, so there is gradually more and more prefixes which are covered by raw, which is great. And this is because network operators like you have been actually issuing rewards for their prefixes, and there is really no good reason not to do it, okay? So that's great. The more problematic line is the red line. The red line is the wrong ROAS. These are ROAS, th these are IP announcements which conflict with some ROAS. So we have some problem. Either these announcements are indeed hijacking announcements, but most of them are not hijacking announcements. Most of these, almost all of them, are simply uh, announcements which are legitimate, but appear, but break some ROAS, but are invalidated by some ROAS. So most probably the ROAS Either the ROA is uh, simply incorrect, maybe giving the incorrect AS number, or the ROA may be correct, but there isn't a, but suddenly the ROA is covering a big other space, and we have the, uh, a smaller prefix within that other space without a ROA, and suddenly it became invalid. So I will explain this uh, scenario, which is a very common scenario in a moment, by a very concrete and real, real example. But the important point, before even we understand why this happens in details, notice that this 
red line is increasing in about the same rate as the green line. So the percentage of the, of the wrong growth remains almost uh, about, uh, about 10 percent of the, of the good growth, okay? And that's a big problem. So if we look at the percentage of IP prefix announcements which are incorrect and would be blocked if we block everything by the ROV, it is a non-negligible percentage. And that's a big concern to anybody thinking about, about deploying ROV. About 10% errors consistently throughout the deployment of this. This is uh, you know, significant, right? And if we drop, if we do our uh, auto origin validation and we drop BGP announcements which con conflict with ROS, then it appears that we are going to lose significant amount of uh, announcements and maybe also of traffic. The problem, in my opinion, and we have some results showing it, the problem is not really as severe as it appears when you look only at the doping of announcements, because you, will, for, for good reasons, you will actually lose probably less traffic than you are losing announcements, but still, you know, it's hard to know exactly how much traffic they will be losing. Obviously, we lose a significant number of announcements, and that's something the transit providers are not do not want to happen, right? Transit providers want to transfer tra traffic. This is, most of this, almost all of it will be legitimate traffic that will be dropped. That's, that's a, a, a problem, okay? Okay, so why? Why do we have these wrong wars? And what can we do about them? Uh, so this is a very typical example we, uh, where we see France Telecom, you know, definitely a very distinct, you know, serious, it's an internet service provider, right? Uh, and Orange or Fence Telecom. And they are actually, they went ahead. Where are we again? Yeah. They went ahead and they issued uh, a ROA. Okay, so you see the ROA they, they issued for the prefix 1942015, and they wrote their own domain, their own ES number. Everything is fine. Except what? This is a large address space that they, they own. But within this other space are other spaces of some of the customers. And these customers, in particular, here is the Nona, okay, the yogurt company. And the Nona is having this small sub prefix within this 15, just 194.235.024. Relatively small sub prefix, right? A, a, a prefix. But when you have an. an ROA for the large prefix of the entire orange, which includes the sub-prefix, then if you apply ROV, you will require also a ROA for the sub-prefix. And if you don't have a valid ROA for the sub-prefix, then the BGP announcement becomes invalid and you will drop it. So that means that announcements from uh, Danone will be dropped by anybody applying ROV. And I hope, uh, well, at least I like yogurt. I'm sure a lot of you like yogurt. The result will be that our supermarket chain will not be able to order yogurts from the none. That's horrible, right? That's unacceptable. Okay. So that's really uh, just an example of some of these many uh, in or air conflicts between BGP announcements and, our, and, and the ROAs which are, uh, have been announced. Okay. What can we do about this? Uh, we'll, we'll see in a moment. But, but uh, first, let's, un let's see. Okay, so if this happens and there are these incorrect uh, or conflicts between ROAS and, and BGP announcements, do people actually do deploy ROV? Do people drop traffic when it conflicts with, with uh, the, the ROAS? And we've done some measurements for that to, to test that. This, uh, I will first, I will actually I will just describe the simplest measurement that we did initially. Later we did more precise measurements. But the simplest measurement is also, I think, uh, illustrates the, the, the scenario, illustrate also the basic techniques that we later improved upon. So it's enough to explain it. And uh, that measurement was, uh, in this measurement, we didn't actually send anything on the internet. We just looked it, we use the fact that we, that we have so many incorrect tours, okay? Uh, so many conflicting uh, BGP announcements announced. And we said, okay, if one of the BGP monitors 
you know, all the servers, you can see the BGP announcement they receive. If one of them receives a BGP announcement which contradicts the uh, error, then this implies that all of the ASs along the path do not apply ROV, because if they would apply ROV, then this announcement would have been dropped. So just by the fact that a monitor received a BGP announcement, which of course you can, you can learn from all these monitor services, but just by that fact, we can identify that all of the ASs along the way did not actually do the filtering. And that alone allowed us to actually identify that many, many ASS ovils do not do the filtering. Although that's a very crude uh, measurement, and again, later we had a much more precise measurement. Already by this measurement, we were able to see that uh, at least 80 of the 100 largest ASS do not apply ROV. Okay. And later, by, by more precise measurement, we found that uh, actually the number of ASS that, that apply globally, that apply ROV, is less than 20 and apparently actually less than 10 and very, very limited. So that's essentially negligible. Now, you would say it's negligible because it's less than 20, but actually it's also negligible because in order to be effective, you must have quite significant deployment. So deployment, very small deployment does not give you almost anything. Okay, and, and the deployment today is almost null. So the situation from deployment perspective of, of ROV is horrible. Of ROAS, we saw that the situation is not so good, but of ROV, the situation is completely terrible. Okay, and in, if we want this standard to succeed, and this standard is relatively simple to deploy, is relatively effective, is quite effective. So we should succeed here, okay? So we should find how, what is the problem and how to fix things in order for this standard to be adopted. Okay. So that's essentially what we are working on. Okay. But just before that, let's understand what is the result of this partial deployment. Okay. Now, uh, in order to, to have uh, some assessment of the impact of partial deployment, we use the standard te uh, technique to do it, which is simulations, because how can you know what is the result of partial deployment, right? Uh, you do simulations of different percentage of partial deployment, and that's uh, a simulation te technique which has a lot of um, um, you know, assumptions and, and problems, but still it is the best technique that, that is known to the community and how to evaluate the approximate impact of deployment. So that's what we will do. Let me describe it briefly, okay? Oh, just a moment, before the simulation, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Before the simulation, there's another important point I want, I will get to the simulation in a moment. And another important point I want to explain, which is this, which explains the problem with partial deployment. Okay, so when we have the partial deployment, we could have this following phenomena which we call collateral damage. Collateral damage means we have do some domains which don't do ROV, some domains which do ROV. We would hope that at least the traffic of a domain that does ROV will not be hijacked. But the uh, collateral damage says, even though your domain, your AS, has implemented ROV, it may be that your traffic will still be hijacked. Why? Because an upper, a, a domain more along the way to the, to the prefix, maybe that some other domain has been, is not implemented ROV, and therefore the traffic is hijacked from there. And this will actually happen very often, as we will see later in the graphs, okay? How, what, the reason is that there is a mismatch between the control plane and the data plane. That is, you're sending the traffic because this is the routing, the, 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 according to the route that you have identified with BGP, but it may be that it will not really go along the entire route as you, as you see from the BGP announcement, because along the way, it will go through some different out, that could happen, okay? And look at this following example, so a very simple example again. We see domain, or AS3, is green because it has implemented ROV, so we'll color it green, wonderful, this is a good domain. Domain two is not malicious, it's just not implementing ROV, and as we understood, most of the ASs on the internet do not, so that's a typical AS, okay? And 666, of course, is an attacker, right? He's a bad guy. Now what will happen here is, 666 is announcing, so this is a legitimate announcement of 110016, 
Here's the route, everything is okay. And here's the bad announcement. The bad announcement is a sub-prefix hijacking attack to 111.0.24. And now the route is, of course, the invalid route. This is a bad announcement. And domain three is well aware of this because we have a ROA. So we know this is a bad announcement. Domain three is implementing ROV. So it's going to drop this, right? Problem solved. It's going to drop this false announcement. Everything good. Okay? Discarding it. Wonderful. Let's discard it. However, what still happens is we have discarded it, but now we are still sending it to domain two because this is the domain that sent us the correct announcement also. Is, so we are sending it to domain two. The problem is that domain two will now send to domain three because domain two is not implementing ROV. So the control path that we think we are using, we think that the data is flowing from three to two to one, but actually it's flowing to three to two and two is sending to 666. Okay, so that's a problem. That's what we refer to as collateral damage. And that problem is very, very common in partial deployment of ROV. Okay, okay so here's the simulation as I explained before. This is a standard technique used to evaluate the impact of partial deployment of new technologies on routing. As we are taking the uh, internet uh, graph from KDAN of all the domains and the topologies and relationships. Uh, that's empirically derived data. Uh, we pick randomly a victim domain and an attacker domain. We, uh, of course, we assume that the victim domain is using ROAS in order to, to check the impact of the validation. So let's assume that the prefix is protected by a ROA. Okay, and let's see what is the impact of that, how useful that was. So we pick randomly some domains which are doing ROV. Again, randomly, and we'll change the percentage to check impact of different levels of adoption. And uh, then, yeah, then we, we find the domains which we'll send to the victim compared to domains which we'll send to the attacker. So that shows us what is the success of the mechanism of, or of the attacker, depending how you want to look at it, right? Okay, so that's what we do. And here is the graph that you will get and uh, or one of the graphs that we got, so just uh, explaining the problem. Okay, so here is the adoption in the top ASs, top ISPs, okay? And the two graphs are when we have, the green graph is when ROV is adopted globally in all of the other ASs by everybody. Only not by this top, uh, excuse me, yeah. Only by, not by the top 100 which are adopting all to this, and the red graph is when the adoption is uh, only 25%. So we see, first of all, if the adoption is only 25%, then the fact that all the top 100 uh, ESS is adopted does not help us at all. Didn't help us, right? Because the percent, the essentially, the traffic is always still hijacked. Okay. Secondly, we see that even if everybody else, all the small ES or medium ES, all of the S's except the top 100 is adopted. This still does not help us for most of the traffic. Most of the traffic is still being hijacked unless we have a lot of the top ASs adopting it. OK. So it's really critical to improve the adoption. Now, how can we improve the adoption? Uh, we have several, several things that we are trying to do to improve the adoption. We have also some stuff that we are trying to help the uh, issuing of wars, but I will focus on the part which is most challenging, most important, which is how to uh, help adoption of ROV. And we saw that there is this huge challenge with ROV adoption. If you adopt ROV, you're going to lose traffic. Can we fix that? Can we make it enable internet providers to actually adopt ROV without losing traffic and still gain the benefits of ROV adoption? So I, I hope you understand, and again, I encourage you to guys to ask questions. I mean, nobody is asking, and that's a very bad, bad signal. Yeah. So please do ask questions, right? Or, or objections even. Okay. So our goal will be to try to fix that. Try to actually adopt, make people adopt it without damaging themselves. Okay. Just telling them, you know, you should do it. 
is not going to help. Nobody is going to lose traffic just because he's told it's good for the uh, good of the internet. And especially after we see these graphs, they say if only you adopt, you may lose traffic. It will not help anybody. So, for really, why, why should they do it? Okay. Okay, so we, uh, the way we are trying to do it is by developing a new version of the RPKI validator that has uh, some smart mechanisms in order to avoid losing good traffic. Okay, and that's why we call it smart validator. May not be such a good name, but uh, that's the name we're using for now. I'll talk about uh, a bit about it, okay? Okay. So, uh, the, the, okay. The first thing we do is we try to help also deployment of wars, uh, to, to deployment of good wars. So we have a website, which uh, I think is still is, is operational, waralert.org, where you can actually test and see if your prefixes are, uh, protect, uh, have e who are issued and uh, if there is some uh, requirement for, for you to issue a war, if you, you need some higher layer provider to, to certify or, and so on. And uh, this also alerts uh, managers of domains if, if there was a, some conflict with some BGP announcement. So you can see if you issue the raw and it conflicts, you immediately can see this and fix the problem. And we actually also use it to send email to, to, to operators and to alert them when they did have such a problem. And quite a lot of them did fix the problem. So something like that, that we really recommend to be deployed officially and it, it, it's... Uh, it can be quite effective. Uh, even when we send it, it was quite effective. Okay. Uh, and now we are going to d discuss the smart validator. Here, and this web address, as you can see, is uh, the address of the project. You are very welcome to go there, to download the code, to give us comments, and so on. Um, it's an open source project, so we. Uh, the goal is simply to encourage and to facilitate the adoption of ROV. Okay. Uh, the phase one of this project is to simply have easy and safe deployment. Do not, do, do not harm to avoid uh, losing good traffic. That's, uh, um, so that's what, by fixing the conflicting wars, and I mean conflicting wars are wars that conflict with good BGP announcements. Now, what are good BGP announcements? Roughly, one could say that announcements which has been out for a sufficiently long period of time are almost certainly good. And indeed, we've, if there are some web services that are trying to identify a suspect BGP announcements, and you can see there that, that the, almost all of the announcements, we, the suspect announcements, do not live more than you know, two weeks at most, two and a half weeks, three weeks is a lot. Because normally, after such period of time, network managers will identify them and uh, remove them. So we can simply focus on these long-lived BGP announcements and make sure they are not uh, uh, blocked because of the validation. And then the others, it's okay to, to block them. That's the basic idea of the smart validator. So it, Actually, a very simple, maybe not a very smart idea. Maybe we should call it a simple validator, okay? Um, the validator is, well, actually, it's not completely open. We are still working on some final uh, QAs and extensions to it, but uh, the code is almost ready, and therefore we are now planning to do some experimentation with it. Then we will uh, welcome you to, to join us because we're looking for network operators that will install the system. The system, when you install it, does not actually do necessarily any blocking. It will just monitor your system and allow you to see what will be the outcome if you, ins you would deploy the out origin validation using different options that the system supports so you can select an option that will not cause you any harm. And in order to facilitate that, we do support multiple ways that you can restrict the filtering done by the system so you are not going to lose any good traffic. Well, the basic rule is just, as I said, the longevity of the BGP announcement. So if a BGP announcement has been announced for sufficiently long, which you can define maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks, then the system will assure you that it will not block it, and therefore you will not lose the, that traffic. And on these very new BGP announcements, if they contradict with, with ROAS, then 
they would get blocked for a short, for this period of time, but hopefully new announcements will gradually be less and less legitimate, will gradually be less and less conflicting with, uh, with what? Yeah. So uh, in phase two of the project, we are going to do some improvement to the security and uh, also to the incentive of people to deploy the system. So we have some ways where uh, the version two of the system will actually make it more likely for, for you to gain customer traffic if you do deploy the, the improved uh, uh, filtering because your customers in the version two will be able to know which of the providers is doing the filtering and therefore will be able to, when there is a risk of uh, hijacking, will be able to prefer the, the provider that does not, uh, that is protected from this risk of uh, filtering. So it will provide an incentive for deployment. Okay, so I think this will be the first point where deployment by transit ISS of this technology will actually be able to result in more traffic to the provider rather than in losing traffic. And again, we think this is a good motivation for people to begin experimenting with the system so that soon they will be able to deploy it and also potentially win traffic, not just lose traffic, or, or, not, or not just not lose tr good traffic. Okay. Um, okay, uh, just to show you the, this uh, graph showing that hijacks are usually short-lived, here you can see the uh, possible due, uh, uh, the graph of the possible BGP hijacking according to s some web services that define, that categorize BGP, what appears to be BGP, real BGP hijacking compared to just the uh, uh, you know, changes and so on, and they categorize them according to, we, we have uh, collected what is the length of time that the, these attacks have persisted, and you see that almost all of them were less than two weeks or less. Three weeks is all and more, is very, very negligible uh, part of the hijacks. So if we just block these, then we actually blocked most of the, of the attacks. And so that will be effective enough and already provide a lot of value to the customers and to the internet community at large. So that's the basic idea. Smart validator allows you to put a line and to say, don't block anything that has been announced, you know, two weeks or more, more than, more than two weeks. So now you're blocking all of these attacks and, you, and yes, there are many, few, few of the attacks which you will not block, but already you provided a great value to your customer. You want to be even more conservative, you can of course put the line that say, I will only block the attacks after this it's one day, okay? Only block attacks after we uh, I block prefixes which will be announced less than, you know, two days. And then you will already get rid of quite a lot of the attacks. So that's already very useful and the impact on, on good announcements will be really very small. So, okay, somebody made a new announcement, you will actually uh, deliver it only after Two days. So two days, this new announcement did not reach anybody. That's, and that already is a, will be a quite rare event, right? So the damage to you and to your customers will be really negligible. Okay, that's the idea of the smart validator. So uh, we allow long-lived BGP announcements, even if they conflict with rules, that will still capture most of the attack hijacks and uh, not cause damage, okay? Um, uh, so it's easy and safe to deploy, just you just plug and play it, it's very easy to deploy. There's no harm to your system. The recommended uh, mode, which is the default of the system, is just to observe the ROAS and the BGP announcements, to recommend to the operator some uh, uh, BGP announcement filters. The operator applies them manually, and we provide what-if scenarios which say, if you will actually allow the system to automatically block in different modes, what will happen? So let's say you install the system and after two, three weeks, you can tell it, supposing that I will actually have told you to, to block, what would have been the impact? And since we can see by the data, which of the announcements are suspected as hijacked and which are legitimate, we can tell you 
how many legitimate traffic you, uh, or announcement you would have uh, blocked by mistake, and how many real attacks you would have blocked correctly if you use the system. And then you can make your judgment. And then you decide if you want to actually move to the uh, automated safe deployment mode. Well, we have two modes, actually. One is we call the ignore mode, where if, such a, if we find a ROA which conflicts with this long-lived announcement, we just ignore the entire ROA. Like the French Telecom example, we'll just ignore the entire French Telecom ROA. Or the extend mode, where we say, we'll extend the set of ROAs. So if we, the none did not announce a ROA, and French Telecom did, the other option will be, we will actually tell the router as if the none has done a ROA for their prefix, and therefore we will not drop traffic or the announcement from the none. So these are the two ways that we can solve the problem of conflicts between ROAs and long-lived BGP announcements. Okay. And we support both of these methods. So you can, as an operator, you can tell our system, show me what would have happened if I use this, show me what happened if I use the other one. You can also de determine the length of time that you want, you know, how, what does it mean long-lived? For me, long-lived is more than two days. For me, long-lived is more than two weeks, whatever and then you see the impact. And only when you are satisfied with the impact and you feel ready, you can turn it on, you know, maybe begin on a period which is this critical, like a weekend and so, and see that really you don't lose good traffic, okay? Um, the whole system is, is based on the RIPE validator, so we, and it is still completely open source, uh, free, so you can use it uh, happily, okay? The, that's the architecture of the system. Um, Time. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, the architecture of the system. So we have a, a data warehouse where we collect all the data. We have a dashboard with the user interface to the user. We have a collection of data from the data resources from the R, uh, uh, RPK repositories, from the monitors, and from the your local uh, routers to see the, what, what are, uh, you know, uh, long-lived uh, BGP announcements that you receive, or that other monitors receive, and uh, also to, to check what, which announcements are uh, considered as possible hijacks. So we, you can see this what-if what scenario. And then the, we have the, the basic engine that is implementing the policy you've set it up and connecting to your uh, routers. Okay, and these are some examples of the dashboard, although it is best uh, if we, you just uh, see the system, we have a, a demo on YouTube, you can see uh, and, and see what it's doing. Oh, of course, you're more than welcome to download it, install it, and you can talk with us to, so we can help you in the process. Uh, in fact, uh, it will be good if you talk with us about it, okay? So uh, here is the recommend mode where you just, the system is just recommending to you, okay, we've seen these uh, announcements and you may want to, uh, to, uh, uh, to invalidate some of the ROAS, to block some of the ROAS so, so they don't, uh, you don't lose traffic, or you may want to uh, whitelist these, these uh, BGP announcements so they are not getting blocked, okay? And you can do this using this uh, manual interface. Um, and here we, you have told the system you need to do it automatically. So you see, after we did the safe deployment mode, you see the green stuff are the BGP announcements which are valid. If we made this, then now all of the BGP announcements are considered valid. The uh, yellow over there are BGP announcements which would have been blocked, but actually are known attacks. And you see that almost all of the announcements that the system receives can will actually be uh, accepted because the percentage of real attacks is really very, very small. And only they will actually be blocked by the system. Okay, so now you can see the demo. I think I will skip that part in order to allow you to go to the demo later and see it by yourself. Yes? And talk a bit about what we are planning uh, and beginning to do for phase two of our project. Uh, so we are uh, adding to the phase one several uh, new ROV features. We also need to re-implement it because uh, we want to move to the version three of the RPKI validator from RIPE, 
which they have completely re-implemented in C++, so we'll re-implement our code too. But in addition to just re-implementation, uh, then we are doing uh, some interesting extensions. One of them is what we call ROV++, which is this uh, incentive-based mechanism where a provider can tell the system to provide, if it has two different providers, and one of them for a specific is doing ROV, uh, is deploying ROV, and specifically ROV++, then it will, the, cust the uh, customer AS will automatically prefer that the announcement from that provider in order to avoid any, uh, p the possibility of traffic hijacking. Of course, you can balance it with, with other considerations, but every customer can define at what, uh, at what point would you prefer to go with a provider that does this ROV, the ROV validation? And that will, pre if, if it, by doing this, you can actually protect yourself from the collaborative damage. So we expect that end customers, organizations, will many times prefer to deploy this option in order to uh, be pro protected from the collaborative damage a risk of, uh, of uh, hijacking, okay? So that will uh, be, be provide an incentive to deploy as well as protection against the, the collaborative damage uh, uh, phenomena. Another thing that we'll have in PES 2 of the validator is uh, another mechanism that which we've presented in, uh, actually in a paper in SIGCOM last year, which is called PES and validation which is an, a very easy to deploy and a strong extension, extension to RPKI where the, it prevents not just prefix hijacking but also origin hijacking. Origin hijacking is similar to prefix hijacking except you, the attacker is not announcing to own a prefix which he doesn't but is, is pretending to be connected to the origin of, the, of that pref, prefix. So RPKI would, as currently is not is not addressing that threat at all. And by, but by doing a very minor extension to RPKI where just the, each origin is also signing the identities of its neighbors, we can actually identify these sort of attacks very easily with existing router mechanisms. So this extension is kind of, without any additional pain, we are getting significant gains, why not? Okay, and uh, our simulations have shown that this provides us uh, it's really surprisingly effective, and this alone, because of the short length of pass on the internet, this alone is providing security, which is almost uh, as what one would hope to achieve with BGP SEC if it was universally deployed, and much, much better than any reasonable partial deployment of BGP SEC, where actually reality is that BGP SEC is quite unlikely to be deployed in any meaningful way at all because uh, of all of the limited value it provides in limited deployment and all of the huge overhead of deploying it. So by doing this small extension, we actually gain almost all that we could have gained if we had this uh, 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 unrealistic adoption of BGPSEC. So uh, I think that... Uh, um, uh, that's it. We are also uh, we, we are doing some research uh, just for your general interest on on routing security beyond BGP because BGP itself is limited uh, and, and it's limited to a single route, of course. So uh, it's it's easy to congest. Uh, it, BGP is not congestion sensitive at all, so uh, routes do not depend on congestion. And when we want to improve routing, also to deal with denial of large denial of service attack. Uh, then we need to, to fix the, this, uh, the, the, the make routing sensitive and responsive to congestion and, and deal with it. Uh, IP itself does not provide, uh, of course, any quality of service, any guarantees for delivery or anything like that. So uh, we have a, a, a design, we, we are working on a design for how to address these problems. This is, of course, a longer term research project. Uh, where we are, we already have the basic protocol for uh, guaranteeing traffic across multiple domains. It's called the uh, secure, accountable inter-domain forwarding. 
that's an ongoing domain. So if you're interested, uh, talk with me about it. Okay, so that's it. Uh, okay, that's it. Con routing security is important. RPI would improve significantly BGP security if deployed correctly. The smart validator sh does improve the, uh, addresses the main problem of route origin validation in phase one, making it easy and safe to deploy. And in phase two, improving security and providing more incentive to deployers. Uh, so see the demo, talk to us, join the experiments, uh, provide us with feedback, ask questions. Thank you. Sophia. Hi, Sophia Silva, Berenguer, APNIC. I'm asking in Spanish, so if you want to. Spanish? Okay. Um, mi pregunta es um, más bien filosófica y refería a terminología. He visto alguna otra presentación similar, o mismo está en el ETF. Y me surge siempre la duda de por qué hablamos de wrong ROAS cuando deberíamos utilizarlos para detectar hijackings, o sea que deberíamos poder considerarlos como ground truth. En realidad no tenemos la seguridad de que esos ROAS que invalidan rutas son equivocados o en realidad están detectando hijacking, porque decimos que esos ROAS hacen que se descarten rutas que son legítimas, pero en realidad no tenemos la seguridad de que son Entonces simplemente que creo que la terminología de wrong ROAS podría ser mejor para que transmita lo que realmente es, que es ROA que invalida una ruta que no sabemos si es legítima, que en algún caso puede ser un error al crear el ROA, pero en algún caso puede estar detectando. ¿Puede ser? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, so, I should I repeat it in English? Or it's okay. No, it should be okay, right? Okay, so you're, you're absolutely right that uh, the term wrong ROA is a bad term. And I'm trying indeed to avoid it. I'm trying to use the term conflicting wars, but maybe it slips me uh, sometimes and I'm still using the term wrong war because I actually reached the same conclusion, like you said, that the term wrong war is problematic because it, first of all, because like you said, who knows if, the, if this is really an attack or not an attack. And furthermore, well, for example, take the guys from France Telecom. They insist that they are not issuing a wrong war. They say, it's not us that are issuing wrong wars. It's just a fault of the none. They should be issuing the war too, right? They are not following the standard. We are okay. We are not going to fix it. Yeah, they, they, they actually insist. We had <laughs> some discussions with them about it. And, well, from their perspective, I guess there is some, some truth in it. I mean, they are supposed to issue these wars. It's only that their, their work contradicts the BGP announcement by the their own customers, so it's a bit weird to me, but never mind. <laughs> uh, so, in a sense, yes, the customer, the non should have issued the war, and the fact that they didn't issue the war may... So the, the term should be conflicting wars and not incorrect or wrong wars. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Alguna otra pregunta? Bueno. Eh, agradecemos nuevamente, eh, muchas gracias, le damos un aplauso. Thank you.